I think most of us here know that the, uh, the Bible teaches that a man and a woman are to remain married for life. Pretty much uh, a basic idea in the Bible. Matthew 19, five and six. Of course, the principle uh, is um, violated in a lot of ways. Of course, we know that. It's not a perfect world. There's uh, obviously uh, all kinds of sins against marriage, adultery, divorce, all types of things. Some people living uh, uh, without the uh, blessing of marriage, homosexuality, all kinds of sinfulness, all kinds of sexual sins in the world. But um, we hope that when people become Christians, however, they once again strive for this, uh, for this ideal. One man, one woman for life. And they are uh, striving for this standard uh, in their lives. So for this reason, it's sad to see, I mean, you know, we see divorce in the world, people who uh, do not follow Christ, make no you know, profession of faith. We kind of see that happening in the world, but we're a little saddened when we see that happening in the church. You know, we're hoping for better uh, in the church. Uh, you expect to see Christians being faithful to their uh, marriage vows as a, a basis for their faith. But uh, we do see a lot of divorce uh, in the church. Seems to be a growing trend. More and more Christian marriages are ending in divorce. So in the last few years, you know, even in, you know, we can't say, we can't look at our own congregation and, and say, oh, well, we're free of that. Nothing ever happens here. We know, we know better than that. You know, it happens. We've seen marriages fail uh, around us. And it's uh, sad to see uh, Christian marriages fail. It's sad to see Christians when they divorce. So I want to talk about this marriage or divorce idea this morning in this class. And I want to start with a question. When I say divorce, what image do you get in your mind? Well, for most people, when I say divorce, the image they get in their mind, uh, lawyers, court, papers, Division of property, custody battles, you know, this is what goes on in a person's mind. If you say divorce, they kind of th think all of those things. We think that uh, if we're not at the point of hiring lawyers, we don't have a problem with divorce. But divorce happens long before we get to court. And if we want to avoid it, there's some things that we need to know, certainly some things that we need to, uh, we need to do, and that's what this uh, lesson is about this morning. If we want to avoid this, if we want to understand it, we have to first of all understand what divorce is and when it's happening to us. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 24 and 25, I need to go back there, there we go. Genesis 2, 24 and 25, it says, for this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and we're not ashamed. So we see in this particular verse, a man and a woman create a new union when they become one flesh. They're glued together. You know, the old translations say they cleave together. It means to be glued together. That's what it means. If you read in Matthew 19.9, the New Testament, Jesus says, and I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. So when Jesus is speaking of divorce, that word there that is uh, translated into the English word divorce in the Greek means to put away or to, to loosen. And so when Jesus was talking about divorce, it wasn't talking about you know, court, lawyers, he used the, the term to put away or to loosen, untie, like a knot you know, that's been tied and now it's being untied, if you wish, it's being loosened. So when using this term, Jesus, as I say, is not talking about court proceedings, lawyers, papers. He's talking about what is actually taking place in the life and in the relationship of the couple. He's talking about one partner beginning to untie the bond that unites them to the other partner. That's what he's 
talking about. And so Jesus reminds us that divorce doesn't begin in court. Divorce begins in the heart and then eventually ends up, in our society anyways, ends up in court. So according to the words used in the Bible, you have a divorce problem when you desire to be glued or united to someone or to something else other than your partner. In other words, you desire to be glued or tied to another person other than your partner. But you know what? It can also mean you desire to be glued to your work more than to your partner or to your hobbies more than to your partner or even to yourself more than to your partner. You know, we have such a, a narrow scope of what we think divorce means. As I said, we think it means just you know, once you're in court in front of the judge and you're, 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 ha you know, you're fighting back and forth over the property and the kids. Yeah, it means that too. But that's the end result. You're at the end game there. Jesus is talking about the actual thing that's going on in the couple. So you have a divorce problem when you'd rather be tied to something else other than your partner and you're in the process of undoing the knot and tying it to something else and it's not always another person. So I know people who have been tied to their work. Their work was more important than their partner. Well that, that couple has a divorce problem, a, 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 a knot problem, an untying problem. Or if you allow someone or something to come between you and your partner. That's another nuance. For example, if sin is coming between you and your partner, some say, well, well how, how does sin come between me and my partner? Well, you know, how about lies, bad habits, unkindness, indifference, selfishness? I mean, I can go on, those are sins. You want to break up a couple? You want to unloose from your partner? Start being unkind in a hundred different ways and you'll find out in a hurry <laughs> how loose that bond's going to get. Or start being dishonest or selfish. Sometimes it's family. You know, um, your parents become more important than your partner. What your mom says is more important than uh, what your partner says. You know, in the, in the Christian home, the priority in a Christian home is that my spouse is the number one important person in my life, and then our children, and then our extended family, and so on and so forth. That's how it works. When you get that order out of whack, you have problems. You have a divorce problem, because you're untying the bond that, that is supposed to unite you. Some people, the issue is ambition. I tell young couples, make sure you don't plan to go somewhere where you can't take your partner with you. So a lot of people you know, are legally married, but they've been working on loosening the bonds. They've been working on untying the knot for a long time in big and in little ways. Every unkind thing you say to your partner you're loosening that bond just a little, a little bit more. Every secret you keep, every lie you make, every one of these things loosens the bond. And that's what Jesus is getting at when he's talking about putting away. Now, how do you avoid this? How do you avoid this loosening business here? Well, first of all, you have to First of all, you have to know what God really thinks about this. You know, I've mentioned this before, but the Bible condemns divorce as a sin, and this should make Christians think twice about doing it. It should also make Christians think twice about doing the things that lead up to divorce. 
You know, the guilty party, you know, in, in, in among Christians, when there's a divorce, there's all this talk about who's guilty, who's the guilty one. You know, we want to be the innocent one. <laughs> in my experience, I've never seen an innocent one in a divorce. I've never seen one perfectly innocent and the other perfectly guilty. There's enough blame to go around when a marriage fails. You know that. So the quote guilty party isn't the one who actually gets a lawyer and files for divorce first. That's not the guilty party. The guilty party is the one who unties the knot. The guilty party is the one that loosens the bonds. The guilty party is the one that separates themselves from the partner in a thousand little ways that causes the final decree to take, to take place. You know, when God pr pronounces on divorce, He's not just talking about lawyers and judgments, He's talking about the ones who have loosened and put away and untied again in a thousand little ways. In Malachi chapter 2 verse 16, Malachi says, for I hate, or Malachi says that God says, I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel, and him who covers his garment with wrong, says the Lord of hosts, so take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. Here the prophet is taught, is, God is speaking to the prophet and says that he hates divorce. He calls it treason. And sometimes we like to throw that around. Oh, God hates divorce. But did you ever wonder why God hates divorce? The reason God hates divorce is that because in every divorce there's sin. There's always sin involved in a divorce. The sin of selfishness, the sin of sexual immorality, the sin of pride, the sin of self-centeredness. There's always sin involved in divorce, number one. And number two, there's always pain involved in divorce. I mean, I look at the audience here and I kind of know you guys. And I know among you here, many have gone through divorce. And to a person, I guarantee you that if you were asked, every single person would say, it was one of the most painful things that I've ever experienced. And it hurt me long after, long after the papers were signed and all that kind of stuff. You know, long after that happened, the pain stayed with me for years and years and years. That's a common saying that people who have gone through a divorce explain. Even the quote, the innocent party, you know, the one I did, you know, the innocent party, the part, not the one who left or abandoned, the innocent party, even that party says, it was terribly painful. I felt all kinds of guilt. So that's why God hates divorce. He hates it because His children go through pain. Of course in Matthew, we read this before, 19.6, Jesus is saying, so they are no longer two but one flesh, what therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. So it's pretty you know, straightforward in the Bible. God forbids divorce. Now, let's, let's understand, the passage here and in other places doesn't say that it's impossible to get a divorce. There are some who think that. Jesus isn't saying it's impossible to get a divorce. He's saying, don't do that. You know, just like the commandment says, thou shalt not uh, you know, steal, thou shalt not uh, commit murder. The law doesn't say it's impossible to murder. The law says don't do that because that's a sin. Well, in the same way Jesus is saying don't divorce because if you do that's a sin. But it doesn't mean you can't do it in the sense that it can't be done, that marriages are not broken through divorce. Of course they are. And then in Hebrews chapter 13, Verse four, the writer says, marriage is to be held in honor among all and the marriage bed is to be undefiled for fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. So the passage here is saying that God will punish sexual offenders who cause divorce. So it's, you know, it's very important, you know, uh, don't forget my main point here. The main point is how do we avoid this divorce business? Well, we need to understand what God thinks about it. That'll help us. 
let's be clear, you know, God, is not, God is not for divorce. And so divorce begins by a lessening of the commitment to remain bonded together and it finishes with a final legal break in court. In our society, that's how it works. And God condemns the beginning, that's the point I'm trying to get at, God condemns the beginning, the, the beginning part of starting to unloosen the bond you know, that holds us together, He condemns that part as much as He condemns the final part which is the final, okay, the bond is now completely apart. So God never approves of us loosening or breaking our bonds, but He does protect the innocent. Let's go back to this passage. It says, and I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery, you are innocent in the divorce proceeding if your marriage is broken through the adultery of your partner. You know, I, I always like to say, well, God does not kick you while you're down. <laughs> he doesn't hurt you more than you've already been hurt. That's why that passage is in there. Yes, the divorce may happen, and yes, it's a painful thing, but the sin is attributed to the one who, who cheated, not the one who is, who is innocent. And then Paul adds to this in 1 Corinthians seven fifteen. he says, yet if the unbelieving one, speaking of a, a partnership, a marriage here between a Christian and an unbeliever, he says, if an unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. So Paul is talking, the inspired writer, talking about innocence if the marriage is broken by the departure of the unbelieving spouse. The idea is God has called us to peace if the spouse will not live with us in peace. A lot of people sometimes say, well, what happens? You know, what do you do if, uh, you know, what do you do if uh, you know, there's abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse? You know, one, one is beaten on the other. You know, do we have to stay in that? You know, how can I obey God's command and, and, and at the same time I'm, I'm, beaten, I'm being beaten up? Of course, God does not require us to you know, simply lay ourselves down in order to be abused. What does the passage say? God has called us to peace. If your partner will live with you in peace. Well, if one partner is abusing the other, that's not peace. So God didn't give these exceptions as a way out of marriage. He gave them to protect the innocent victims of broken marriages so that they would have to uh, not bear the burden of guilt in addition to the pain of suffering from a failed marriage and also not have to simply uh, you know, withstand abuse in order to you know, maintain a, a marriage. God, God doesn't call us to do that. What else do we have to know in order to uh, in order to avoid divorce. Well, know how to keep the bond. If divorce is unloosening the bond, then how do you avoid it? Well, figure out ways where you can keep that bond nice and tight. So it's not just about avoiding bad things, it's also about doing certain things that will help avoid the temptation to loosen those bonds that lead to divorce in the first place. So here's a couple of things necessary to keep those bonds, to keep that glue strong. First of all, it requires complete honesty. Good marriages require good communication and good communication requires total honesty. You know, when the bond is weakening or threatened, we need to be open and honest about the reasons for it. If the reason that the bond is being loosened is some kind of sin, we need to confess it, acknowledge it. If it's someone else or something else, we need to expose it. Usually both parties have things that they need to reveal many times. If what is loosening the bond between that couple is family pressure of some kind, or children, or friends, or work, or hobby, you know, someone, something that's interfering with our relationship, then we need to offer reassurance that our partner has the priority position. 
You know, I have found in, in my own counseling of couples, especially those going through you know, divorce issues, again, I don't just mean court, I mean you know, the, the, the bonds are getting looser and looser. I've, I've rarely found that couples come in when things are going great so I can just tell them how good they are. <laughs> I rarely, I rarely have couples that come in and say, you know what, we just wanted to come in and tell you what a wonderful marriage we have and how happy we are. You know, everything is marvelous. That's why we booked an hour of your time because we want to tell you how marvelous everything is and we want you to tell us how good we are. <laughs> 34 years I've been preaching, that never happened, not one time. No, what happens is couples come in and they have, they have problems. And do you know the number one thing and this is simply anecdotal, I can't quote a study from a hospital, but in my own experience, the number one thing that partner A or partner B seems to need, one word, assurance. Assurance. Partners need to be reassured that they are okay, that the relationship is okay, that who they are and what they are, it's okay. So many times in a marriage we, we stop telling each other, you're okay. I married you because you had things that I wanted and, and, and those things are still there. So many couples stop saying to each other, I love you. And I don't just mean the three words, I love you. I mean saying it in a variety of ways that says, I love you. My wife loves the end part of French bread. You know what I'm talking about, you know, crusty bread, the end part, she loves that part. I like it too, but she really, and so we've been married 35 years, and in 35 years, I have never eaten the end piece of a French bread. <laughs> it's not a big thing, it's not a big thing. But every time we get that hot crusty bread you know, from by for less and I bring that home and I put that thing down and I cut it, that first piece goes to her because she, she likes that. Now we've long ago stopped saying, oh thank you, you're so nice, you know, when we were first married. Oh, you're so, nice. you're so sweet thinking of me. We've gone past that. That tiny little act of kindness is built in to our relationship. And I, and I, and I could tell you, you know, dozens and dozens of similar things that go both ways, things that Lise does for me. They're, they're stitched, the act of kindness is stitched into our relationship. But so many couples you know, stop stitching anything kind to say or do in their, in their couple. And what they don't realize is that by stopping to do that, consciously do that, what they're doing is that they're unconsciously loosening the tie that binds them. There should be no such thing as keeping our lives private or independent. One flesh means one mind, one body. It's impossible without total honesty. So if you want to avoid the, uh, the unloosening, total honesty, the idea of kindness obviously is the best kind of honesty are honest words of love, honest words of kindness, honest words of encouragement. To be told and to be shown, I still love you. You know, you, you know why, right? Because when we're married, you know, I tell people, we all were good, we all were good looking once. <laughs> once upon a time, we all you know, at least thought we were good looking. <laughs> but you, you know as well as I do, time goes by, right? And the physical beauty starts to fade somewhat. The energy and the virility starts to decrease somewhat. And what is needed are honest words of affection and love and kindness to kind of remind us, you know what, you may be going to pot, but I still love that old pot. 
Another thing required strengthening the bond, complete fidelity. This does not just mean avoiding sex with someone else. That's obvious, you know, that's naturally included. Faithfulness in marriage means that we keep oneself totally exclusive for our partner. Our eyes, our hands, our hearts, our thoughts, our words. The best side, the best words, the best attitude, we reserve the very best for our partner. You know how this works? You know, sometimes men, you know, they're cheerful at work. Well, wow, Mr. Cheerful, always joking around. And we're charming with the waitress you know, that serves us at the restaurant and we're just a good sport with our buddies. But none of that seems to make it past the front door when we get home. Because the guy has given away the best of himself to everybody else. And when he comes home, he's got nothing left to give to the person who deserves the very best. Sometimes if you look the other opposite direction, some women, you know, they get along with their parents and they'll excuse the shortcomings of their friends, but they continually nag their husbands. I'll tell you something, better you nag your friends than your husband. <laughs> You'll get a better payoff that way. Some spouses work harder at their jobs than they do at trying to please their partners. The more exclusive our relationship is, the more precious it becomes. Because exclusivity keeps our emotional and physical relationship fresh and satisfying. I have couples, one of the big complaints, you know, especially couples who've been married for a while. Hmm. I don't know, our sex life, you know, we, you know, when we were first married, we were making love, you know, three, four, five times a week. I don't know what happened. Yeah, it's called children. And they say, I just don't know what happened, you know. How do we get that back? And they, you know, they read all the gurus and stuff like you know, books. There's a zillion books, you know. What, do we try pills? Do we try, what do we do, you know? And I tell them, you want to find that thing there that may have escaped you? That makes your partner desirable? Try becoming more exclusive with your partner. Try preserving the absolute very best that you have and give that to your partner. And see if that doesn't begin, uh, doesn't begin the, uh, the process, the cycle of desire between yourself and between them. And a lot of times, you know, our, our, our sex life isn't that great because we're not honest about things. We don't talk about it. We don't, we don't honestly share with one another what our needs are and what our fears are and what are the things that kind of block that intimacy. We don't say anything, we're just quiet. And then we wonder why things don't, don't go well. But as far as complete fidelity is concerned, if we trust our partner because of their demonstrated absolute fidelity and devotion, we'll have confidence to open up and to explore and to change in order to please them. I will open up and become much more vulnerable to my partner in intimacy if I trust them. But if I don't trust them, then it's hard for me to give myself to them. So if we feel neglected or a wavering on the fidelity of the other, we will lack the confidence to completely give ourselves as well and, and a kind of a vicious cycle of unraveling marriages you know, is the result. I, I loosen a bit because I don't trust, they loosen a bit because they don't trust. Oh yeah, well watch this and pretty soon we're pretty far apart. How else to avoid or how, how else to strengthen? Complete submission to Jesus Christ. 
See, for a, a lesson to individuals who had no faith would, would have stopped at this point. But because we are people of faith, we can add probably the most important component, complete submission to Jesus Christ. In the end, what is it about a woman that will make her a joy to her husband? We read in Proverbs 31, 30, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. I already mentioned that, you know, we tend to go to pot over the years. Solomon says it in a much more poetic way. Charm is deceitful, beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. And he goes on to say, by whom? by her children and by her husband. She's not interested in being praised by the world or by her girlfriends. Her interest is being praised by her children and by her husband. You know, I, I want my wife to be a good Christian because that's the only way she will be complete as a wife for me. Proverbs 12.4 an excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who shames him is like rottenness in his bones. And in the end, what makes a man worthy of a godly woman? Joshua says, very familiar passage, he, said, he says to the people at one point, if it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are now living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. A man completely dedicated to the doing of the will of the Lord will win the respect and the confidence of his wife. A woman will gladly submit to a man who, like Christ, is willing to lay down his life. And again, you know, sometimes men misunderstand this passage. You know, they think of it in grand terms. Would I lay down my life for my wife? You know? Well, if there a burglar ever came into our house and you know, put a gun towards my wife, I'd jump in front of that and I'd take the bullet for her. You know what I'm saying? Or if somebody you know, said, okay, it's going to be you or your wife, Who's, who are you going to die? You know, I'll do it. You know, we think that in our minds. That's just, you know, that's the Hollywood version of courage. But are men willing to lay down their lives one drop at a time for their wives? Because for most of us, that's how we lay down our lives for our wives. In other words, do we give up our pride? Do we give up our selfishness? Do we give up our own personal desires? Are we willing to give up our life a drop at a time for our wives? That's a little different, isn't it? Paul says in Ephesians 5, husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. You know, we complain, that, oh, the modern woman, she doesn't want to be in submission to her husband. But it works the other way too. The modern man is not always ready to give up his life for his wife. And I don't mean in a heroic fashion, although it might come to that at some point. I mean one little drip at a time to give up his life, his life, what he wants, what he feels is right, what he enjoys. Is he willing to put that aside in order to give his wife the kind of life that she needs? You know, when when Jesus Christ rules the heart of the man and the woman, He's the glue, He's the knot that keeps the couple bonded and cleaving together as one flesh. And then finally, one other thing to strengthen that bond, we need to develop spiritual intimacy. 
The marriage vow enables us to practice emotional and physical intimacy without guilt or shame. In marriage we become one flesh and we create that one flesh through physical intimacy. In order to secure the bonds, however, we must learn to cultivate not only physical intimacy, but spiritual intimacy alongside of the physical. And so um, spiritual intimacy comes from the overflow of our own personal spiritual intimacy with God. You understand what I'm saying here? It's hard to develop spiritual intimacy with someone else if you yourself do not experience spiritual intimacy with God. It's very hard to be effective and say, okay, let's have a prayer, you and me, my wife and me, let's, let's, have, let's pray together. You know? It's very hard to be a leader in that sense if you by yourself never say to yourself, I think I'm going to take a little time out, quiet moment here, and I'm going to go pray by myself. If you don't do that, it's very hard to be a spiritual leader of your, of your own family. You know, there are several other roadblocks that hinder the development of spiritual intimacy with our partner. Hectic schedules, no time for prayer. No time for prayer, just too busy. And that's true. Poor communication. People don't know how to share or to open up about spiritual things. I'll tell you one way to break open spiritual intimacy, when I say break open, I mean to, to really get into it. Like Paul says, confess your sins one to another. Try that, I guarantee you. I guarantee you that'll, that'll, that'll start the spiritual discussion. Unresolved issues, unresolved problems in marriage. You know, a lot of times uh, couples, well, I've seen couples come in for counseling to make their marriages, you know, to help their marriages, to, to kind of strengthen those things. And, and, and we spend the 40 minutes them arguing in front of me and me serving as the referee. <laughs> it don't get a whole lot done in, that, in those 45 minutes. So the idea of being completely honest and open and pray for me and confess my sins, you know, sometimes confessing of sin helps to resolve certain issues. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is one that is specific, you know, very kind of a niche thing. Feelings of spiritual inferiority. In other words, one person in the relationship has much more Bible knowledge than the other person. Maybe the wife was a Christian, grew up in the church and so on and so forth, and her husband became a Christian just perhaps shortly before they were married, let's just say. And instead of helping him you know, grow spiritually, a lot of times she's using the Bible as a hammer you know, to get her way. And it works the other way as well. We have to be very, very careful. And of course, lack of spiritual experience, Couples who don't go to church, they never study the Bible, well, they just have a hard time developing spiritual life. So I, I, I care enough about you to make an effort. You know, unconditional commitment to the marriage allows time for growth, helps you to do the things that, that care. So here are some of the things that you can do. As I mentioned, demonstrate, vocalize, acknowledge your unconditional commitment. Hey, we may be having problems maybe, but I'm here. I'm never going away. I will always be here. Believe that. Look at me. Hear my words. To be able to say that and do the things that demonstrate that. Intimacy builders. Develop a caring atmosphere, an environment of trust in your home and in your relationship. Honest communication, ask for what you want. Sweetie, I, I need to tell you this, this is what I need. It's not always about sex, I, I need this here or I need that over there to, 
to, you know, to feel close to you. Also model, model what it is that you need in your life. Modeling helps the other person see the things that are important to you. And also understand spiritual types. Remember, all of this here is under the heading of how do we build intimacy? Unconditional commitment, caring atmosphere, honest communication, modeling behavior, understanding spiritual type. Some people know God through study. Other people feel God and His love. They're, just, they have a, they're wired in such a way that they are able to feel the love of God. They're very close to that. And others through doing God's work and service. Everybody is different when it comes to godliness. Listen to one another. Study to know your mate and identify their expectations from you. The best compliment your mate will ever make to you is, she really gets me. He really gets me. If your mate is able to say that to you, then you guys are on your way. Spend time together. You need quantity time in order to build quality relationships. No way around it. Check in time. Let the other person know where you are in your day and let them know where you are emotionally. Share bonding times together, trips and projects and prayer and worship and serving and giving. We tie the knot at the wedding, but we tighten the knot by developing spiritual intimacy. You know, divorce is always a temptation in this society. I believe we're the third in divorce rate behind Sweden and Denmark. We can, however, divorce-proof our marriage. Remember, as I close out, watch for the danger signs and admit them. Things that tempt us to unloosen, words that we say, whatever, that unloosen the bond. Ask yourself, in doing or saying this, am I tightening or loosening? I'm almost done. Understand that it's wrong. Divorce is a failure. That's just what it is. It's the failure of the marriage and there's enough blame to go around. It's not the unforgivable sin. Like all sins, we can go to God and ask Him to forgive us. That's, that's okay. But at least we, un we need to understand that it, it is a sin. And then thirdly, work at things that will keep the bond strong. Truthfulness, fidelity, submission to Christ, cultivate spiritual intimacy. Remember one thing, while we are still married, never too late to avoid, never too late to divor uh, avoid the divorce. All right, well that's our class for today. I appreciate you, uh, your attention. That's it for now, thank you.